I've got a topic this week that has been on the list since the beginning, but this week was the week I fully felt the passion to talk about it. And that is the topic of being uncoachable. But before we get to that, I want to share some good news. I got the surprise last week, but I couldn't talk about it till this week because of a social media blackout, which makes it sound very, very important and hush hush. But I was selected to be part of the announcer crew for the North America East Continental Cup in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. So if you are going to be at that tournament, please come by and say hi. I'd love to meet you. I'm so excited. This is my my WFTDA postseason debut. I was a little surprised to be picked. I'm really excited for the opportunity. I think it's going to be so much fun. So you might hear my voice coming to you from Pennsylvania at the end of August, August 23rd to the 25th. I'll try to post on the Twitter or the Instagrams or whatever where I'll be lurking if you if you want to come find me. All right, let's start this episode today. I'm going to set the mood. Thunder is rumbling outside. Like clouds have been rolling in for quite some time. I'm hearing the thunder. I really hope that the power doesn't go out while I'm recording because that would be a bummer, but I'm going to plug ahead anyway and assume everything is going to be fine because I control the things that I have control over. And I have control over the fact that I have power right now and the gumption to do this episode. So let's start by just asking the question, what does it mean to be coachable without the un? So where does this term come from? Let's take a step back and ask even more like, well, what is coaching? I think coaching is advice encouragement, challenge, guidance, teaching, and listening. Setting goals together with your athletes for themselves and for the team and chasing those goals. The coach can't do the job for you. They aren't out there holding your hand, but they do their best to get you as prepared as possible to achieve the success you want, the success that you're chasing in your sport. So this could be anything. This could be passing minimum skills, getting your first roster spot, learning a new position, anything. Coaching is, you know, there's a person who cares, who's trying to help you get where you want to go. But the rest is up to you. That's where this word comes from. Like the rest of this word comes in now. The word able. The word able is incoachable. It's hiding there at the end, (laughs) meaning you are an able-bodied person. You are mentally able and emotionally able. You are able. You are able to do things. You are able to push yourself. You are able to face challenges and rise to the occasion. You're not helpless. You're not a victim. You are an active participant in your own success And you better be the most enthusiastic participant in your own success or you won't be going anywhere very fast. And when I'm using the word coach today, this does not have to be one person assigned to coach your team. This could be anyone on your training committee, captains, veteran skaters, mentors, even a coach that doesn't coach your team. Maybe they don't even coach your sport, but they see something and might have something to offer. The term coach is applying to a knowledgeable person who wants to help you improve. And then to make my life easier going forward, I'm pretty much just going to use the word coach to apply to that type of person, all right? So coaches, they have a lot of people to look after, right? There's lots of people to look after and push forward. So picture everyone on your team in line on a swing set. It's one of those nice long swing sets like you had in elementary school going all the way down the row. So the coach is walking down the line and giving each skater a push. And after that, the coach can push once in a while, but it's up to the skater to pump their legs and keep going. 
So the skater needs to straighten out their legs when they go forward and bend their knees to come back. Okay, now let's picture one skater down at the end. And for some reason, they've dug their feet into the sand. The coach tries to push and they barely move. The coach tries to suggest, uh, how about you lift your feet, maybe point them forward so this push can get you started. And they don't move. Or maybe they just like lift one foot now so the swing gets like funky and off balance and weird. Do you have somebody in your league like this? Somebody who's kind of digging their toes in the sand and maybe they don't know it? Or are we going to find out today that that person might be you? So if people talk to you about something every week or two and there's no change, you are being uncoachable. Notice I didn't say you are uncoachable because I don't deal in absolutes here. Everyone's on a spectrum. Everyone is capable of change, of remaking themselves into who they want to be. This might be the first time you've really become aware of these tendencies and understanding why you might be being treated the way you are, why people might drift away from you, because it's hard to help someone whose feet are dug in the sand. So today I've got six recommendations for skaters who might be uncoachable. Dun, dun, dun. We're going to get away from being uncoachable. We're going to be coachable. All right. Recommendation number one. Ask. <laughs> ask questions. Ask questions if you don't understand. If you don't understand something, whether it be a strategy, a skill, a drill. No one's a mind reader. So if you're standing off to the side, we don't know if you're confused or tired or what's going on. We just see somebody standing there. And we don't know why. Also, you should ask for feedback or ideas on how to tackle skills you might be struggling with. It's possible you can, maybe you came to Derby with low self-confidence, low self-esteem. There's a lot of us out there. Some of us came to Derby because we wanted to feel powerful and we didn't feel powerful before. Many of us, whether we felt powerful before or not, become, we feel a lot more empowered after we've joined roller derby. But you're still, maybe you're still finding that. Maybe you don't feel that power yet. And you're looking at everyone around you and how easily all the skills are coming to them. Maybe you're feeling bad about yourself that it's taking you longer. If you aren't asking for help because you're afraid of inconveniencing others on the team, that you don't have as much value as other people around you because they're more skilled than you right now. First, I'm going to tell you, you absolutely do have value. You are so valuable. There's few things more valuable to a league than a person with passion for the sport. And you had to have some measure of passion to walk in the door in the first place because it's a little scary, right? I, not many people can do this lightly. There's a lot of risk involved. And second, you're not going to get there faster by digging your feet in the sand and sitting by yourself. This isn't a solo sport. You aren't all alone on one side of the net waiting for a ball flying an insane amount of miles per hour to come straight at you. You are always surrounded by people in the same boat as you working together. You can always approach any of these people. Help is there. I want you to be assertive and ask for it. T think of this as one step closer to the bravery you need to play your best in a game. Talk to one person a practice. Make that your goal. One person. Ask them something. Number two, recommendation. Be honest with other people about the challenges you are facing. This could be your conditioning. Maybe you don't have really great endurance. This could be your mobility. Maybe you're just having trouble getting your body to move the way other people's bodies are moving. If you tell other people, they might have suggestions on how you can get there, or they might hear, oh, your hips aren't as open. 
well, neither is this person's. And um, they've figured a workaround where they switch from one foot to the other. Here, other person, come over here on, and show how you do that. Like, not everyone has to do everything the exact same way. We just all have to be effective. Like, stops don't all have to look perfectly the same, but you do need to stop, right? So if, if you can figure out a way to stop safely and do your version of the stop, maybe that's going to be all right. It, if you have trouble with availability, getting to practice, and you're afraid to tell people about it, like, they're not going to know unless you say something. If with, When people don't show up, you have to make guesses like, oh, maybe they're sick. Maybe they're taking care of their children. Maybe they had to work late. Maybe they don't want to be here. And depending on the type of person they are might influence what choice they make in their head, what guess they make. Just be honest. Like whatever is challenging you, other people are willing to help. Maybe there's a babysitter at practice that can help you out and you just need to tell somebody about it. And also part of honesty is communicating with your coach on your best learning style. So if you consider yourself to be a visual learner and you know you want to see it three or four times first before you attempt it, and you're standing off to the side, um, maybe coach doesn't know what you're doing. You're standing off to the side watching the drill. They don't know why. But if you just need to see it a few more times because that's how you process and you explain that in advance, like, I don't want to be the first to do it. I need to see everyone else do it. And then I'm going to go, okay, that's something we can work with. That's something we can figure out. Now we know exactly what you're doing. If you need to hear more words and talk about it and, and hear an explanation, that's something we can work on. Uh, whatever it is you need, they can probably help you figure it out because if your learning style isn't like everyone else's, we want you to learn too. So let's figure out a way that we can accommodate everyone here. And that means you. Now, the third one I've got here, this is a big one, this recommendation. Put in the time. Use practice time wisely. Don't spend your whole turn in a drill talking. This could be the time you could be spending learning and experiencing what this skill feels like. Like one of the ways you work out what's working and not working is to do it. The, you have to goof up and then realize, oh, I goofed up and then you can fix it. But if you don't try, you won't even get to have experience it goofed or not goofed, right? <laughs> you can always try to come a little early to practice. Or stay a little late. Get more reps in on the stuff that you are struggling with. You can always use water breaks to get in a few more tries. And the best part of that is if you are using this extra time that is there in practice, people will notice. People will see you hustling. They will see your drive. And they're going to believe in you more and want to help you more because they will see your effort. Also, you could be putting in work outside of practice. If you aren't being given the opportunities you think you should on your team, you're not at the level you want to be at yet. You're not considered to be at the level that you think you are, so you need to do a little better. If you want to increase your rate of progress, you can't depend just on the hours of practice you get every week. There's not that many. Practice time is limited. Rent is expensive. So you should be getting more familiar with your skates outside of practice, whether it's trail skating, park skating, maybe practicing skills in your driveway. I've done that. Off skates training, you can be working on your core, your balance, your flexibility, your explosiveness, your endurance. That's something we all need to be better at, right? All of these things will help you get more game ready and help you progress more ready for that role you want on the team. And finally, with this time you should be putting in, you should be watching more Derby too. Watching Derby on WFTDA.TV and in person. There is so much you can learn about the rules, strategy, and generally what to expect being in a game by watching. 
All right, the rain is definitely coming down where I live now. I don't know if you can hear it through the microphone. We are gonna take a quick break where I make sure all of my windows are closed and then we will be right back to talk about the last three. back. Ah, I fixed it. The, the rain was coming in a little bit. We're all good now. All right. Recommendation number four on how you can be more coachable. Actually try to do the things your coach asks you to do, whether it be a skill during practice or a recommendation for something to help you outside of practice. Maybe you've been dealing with an injury and you've been really, really, really stubborn about it and they really want you to go to a doctor and you haven't gone. Chances are you are less likely to get rostered if there is doubt about your condition to play, that you might be injured. If they're really asking you to go to a doctor, please go to a doctor. If it's a simple thing of you should be doing ice and ibuprofen and every time you go to practice, you're like, oh, I keep forgetting to do it. And I'll admit, I am one of these people. I forget to do the icing part sometimes. <laughs> but if you need to do this, do this. If you have trouble moving the way you want to, and you know you should be doing yoga, and you've said you know you should be doing yoga, and people are sending you all the dates and times of yoga in your city, please go to one. Go to one. Just pick one. It doesn't matter what type it is. Just go try yoga because any type of yoga is gonna help you at this point, right? Consider intervals to help with your heart rate going up and down. Think about your agility out there on the track to be a little bit more bouncy, a little bit more ready to go places. Your balance so that you can switch from one leg to another and you don't fall over when you hit somebody or be hit so much. And you know, watching Derby. These are very common things that people might be asking you to do, suggestions they have for you. And if you just plain aren't doing them, you're not showing evidence that you want this, that you want to improve. Because then when coach asks you to step it up in a game, they don't have faith in you that you're gonna because every time they ask you to do something, they don't see any change. They don't see any difference. They like, you just haven't. So please do something that shows you heard. If someone is taking time out of practice because they really care about you and they want you to do well and they give you a suggestion, at least try it. Whether it be the way to move your body right now during this drill, give it a try or something you can do outside of practice that can make you better. Just try to make a little bit of time for it. I swear, if you watch 10 minutes of a derby game, it's going to help. <laughs> Even just a little bit, right? 10 minutes of yoga would be better than zero minutes of yoga. I'm sure you have some amount of time you could be putting into a recommendation someone has given you. Because if you continually disregard recommendations, then you're going to stop getting them. People will be discouraged. They'll see your feet in the sand and they won't want to give you a push anymore. Number five, don't be a full cup. What I mean by this is, uh, you know, you ever hear the one where, uh, I think it was something where it was like a wise person wanted some knowledge, but their cup was full. Anywho, if you have a full cup, you can't pour anything else into it, right? Because it's overflowing. There's a limited amount of stuff that can fit in there. So the metaphor is if you think you're right and you know everything, your cup is full. There's no room. You might not be as ready to hear opinions of others if you think that they're wrong. Or you might not want to learn a new play or strategy if you have already decided it won't work. 
If you argue points without at least hearing a person out, you could be seen as uncoachable. Maybe you don't like this person. <laughs> You're never going to listen to a single thing they say. But there might be some value there. And if your cup is full, you're not going to hear it. I want to tell you a story. A guy I met in college was in the theater department, and he had a lisp. He lands his first role in a big stage production at the university. They want to take a chance on him. There is a student who is the assistant director for this play, and she was not super well-liked in the department by a lot of people, and um, not super well liked by this person. They didn't like each other, all right? I'll just say they didn't like each other that much. Um, so she was exercising her assistant director role-ness and took this actor aside for coaching one day to help him with his lisp, helped coach him how to shape his mouth to properly enunciate. And it turned out no one had ever told him he had a lisp. He didn't know he was speaking differently from anyone else. He never knew. And he had had it his whole life and now felt embarrassed he didn't know. I was frankly a little bit embarrassed that this person he didn't particularly care for was the person pointing this out to him. But she wanted to help him. They had a good first session. She got him an appointment with a speech therapist. And once he knew about the problem, he worked on it all the time. And now that he could listen for it and he knew he was aware of it, every time it started to happen, he'd go back and say the word properly, say the sentence properly, overemphasizing everything until the habit stuck. And it did. It, it really, really did. It seemed like it was gone in just a couple of weeks because he was so determined. And if he hadn't listened to that student, that assistant director, if he had let his personal feelings get in the way, he wouldn't have gotten that valuable coaching, which resulted in, frankly, people took him more seriously after that. People listened more to what he had to say. And this changed his life. But he had to be open to it. He had to listen to somebody else. Somebody, and another person in the situation might have been in denial about it or try to hide in a hole for shame of the embarrassment because you didn't know. And uh, like he very publicly had to change the way he spoke in every conversation until he beat it. So the point of this is you might not like the source the information is coming from, but don't discount the information because it could be something really valuable they want to share with you. And number six, my recommendation, take challenges as opportunities, not barriers to entry. If a coach tells you that you aren't ready to scrimmage yet because of certain benchmarks you have to meet in your minimum skills, use this as a challenge to prove you can do it. If you're given specifics you need to hit, tackle them with enthusiasm. They aren't doing this to punish you because they don't like you or they don't want you on the team. It's for your safety and the safety of others that you pass that first test. And then it's for the good of the team and yourself that you be genuinely ready to scrimmage with all the physical mobility and mental awareness that it takes. So ask yourself, really, what motivates you the most? If someone says you can't do it, does that drive you to prove them wrong? Is that how your personality works? Or, or is it more, does that discourage you and make you believe them that you're never going to get there and then you just feel sorry for yourself? If you know what drives you best, you can get on the same page with your coach. Like You're a grown-up. This is a personal thing. Like, really think internally how what do i respond to best what really lights me up and gets a fire going in my belly to do something and what discourages me and makes me want to sit this one out because we want the fire in the belly kind <laughs> okay let's use an example an example of a situation where it seems like 
you are uncoachable and what we can do about it. Let's say you grip people too hard when you're bracing. This is the person who is standing, who is backwards, facing the blockers, communicating, and helping slow down the jammer a little bit more. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> oh, I need to bring water. Okay. You're gripping people too hard. You leave bruises on them. You're causing multiplayer blocks. You're limiting your teammates' range of motion because you won't let go. Someone talks to you about it and you're like, yeah, yeah, okay, sure. But you still do it. Someone else talks to you. Same thing. A coach comes over and offers their opinion, explains why this is important and what it's impacting and how you can alter your hand placement to be more effective. But you just slip back into your old habit. If you say you can't change or that you can't control it, you won't change. So ask yourself why this isn't working. Why you are having difficulty replacing the old habit with a new one. In this case, what I've noticed most often is it might be you are having a bit of a panic response to someone coming in hot and you feel like you need to grab on to people as a way of maybe protecting yourself. You just see that and you kind of freak out a little bit. You don't know where it's coming from, but it is happening. If you can recognize it, you can work on it. Or maybe you don't trust the players you work with and you think you need to move them into position instead of letting them have the freedom to move themselves. But whatever it is, if you don't get at the core of the reason, the core of why you are doing the thing, if you're not working on it at a deep personal level, you won't be able to teach yourself to relax when you want to grip. This is something that happens in the moment, so you have to change it in the moment. Just like the earlier example of the actor. It was a little embarrassing for him to have to restate sentences correctly in everyday conversation, but he knocked off a lifetime habit by doing it. He put in the work, he put in the time, and he had to do it every day every time he spoke. You have to care and want to change. Really commit to a concentrated effort to change your habits. I'm giving you this list because your coaches and your coach types, they genuinely want the best for their team. They wouldn't even try with you if they didn't care, but some of you are sitting on the swing set with your feet in the sand, wondering, why the coach is pushing other people and not trying with you as much. When a player is resistant to coaching, non-reactive to coaching, seemingly oblivious to coaching, ap appearing to stay the same, and doesn't appear to try anything you suggest, it's very frustrating because they want to help you so much, but you need to help yourself. You need to do the work. You've got to meet your coach at least halfway or more. They have a lot of people to care for at the playground. There's a lot of swings going. If they spend all their time with you and you don't move forward, everyone else is getting neglected. Now you're all alone at the end of the swing set. Maybe you are thinking you're unappreciated, that you're neglected, people aren't as invested in your progress, but maybe you don't recognize all the effort around you to push you forward and how at the core of it, you are the one standing in the way, not the coach. And if you're that other type of player, that quiet player that doesn't want to bother anyone, but feels like they're never going to get anywhere, I'd encourage you to be assertive. Talk to one person every practice about something you want to work on. Or if you don't know what to work on, ask them what you should work on today and could they give you pointers about it. I know things get pretty crazy at the playground with all those swings going everywhere, but at the end of every recess, the bell rings and we leave the playground. I don't want you to leave without feeling that air going through your hair, without getting that push that makes you feel like you're flying. I want you to have fun at recess. <laughs> I want you to get what you came here for. So figure it out. Are you not understanding the coaching being given to you? Are you not listening to the coaching being given to you? 
not applying the coaching being given to you? If you are someone who thinks X amount of time in Derby means things are going to be handed to you, that's not how it works. You don't get success just by being here. You have to put in the work and meet your trainers halfway. All those coaches and coach types lose heart if they feel they're talking to a brick wall and you don't answer. Maybe you don't talk to them or you resist the change. They don't sense you're wanting this, your effort level. Like, don't blame your coach. How could every coach, captain, veteran skater who has worked with you be against you? You know, if you want to make the world a better place, you got to look at yourself and make the change. Na 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 na. You get what I'm saying? So frustrated skaters should ask this question. What do I need to do for next practice, for next month, for the next game? If you are given something, work on it. Show improvement. They will notice and they will give you another thing to do. A coach won't give you something you can't do. They are not going to give you something impossible because they believe in you and they want to see you succeed. The cycle of improvement will keep you going, keep you motivated, and get you closer to your goal. If you need more help, ask someone on the team who is good at what you are trying to do. Good teammates want to see other players succeed. If you fear you may have been uncoachable in the past, it might take a bit for your teammates to be enthusiastic in helping you, but they do want you to make progress. They will help you. The only way out of this uncoachable cycle is to show improvement and effort, show hustle, intensity, energy, and enthusiasm in tackling your goals. If you're living in the limbo land with no goal, no improvement, but you still think you should be playing, this is where you lose people. This is where people start to walk away from you because they think, I, I don't know what to do with you anymore. But we didn't come here to stay the same. Did you think you came to roller derby to be the same person you've always been? Because you were perfectly happy with your life as it was and you wanted nothing to change? Chances are no. Chances are you came to roller derby because you wanted something to be different. There's a reason you're here doing this. It's an unusual sport and it asks a lot of you. Or did you come here to say you play roller derby and wear cute outfits? Why are you here? If you want to be a skater, you need to skate. All of us are here because there's something we want we can't get in our daily lives that only comes from the challenge of being a roller derby athlete. Dig deep and ask yourself what is holding you back from meeting the goals you want and what you can do about it. Because none of us can do it for you. You have to take the action and responsibility for achieving your roller derby dreams. This isn't someone else's job. This is your job. Because you are able. I'm going to take one more quick break before we finish up the podcast today. All right, we're back. I actually have a mailbag question this week. Funny thing, I actually, uh, the podcast, the page, Instagram, various things, we get a lot of messages and it just doesn't occur to me that they might want to be answered on the podcast. So this week I was like, oh, I recognize that this is something I can answer on the podcast. Like, watch for it there. I'm going to do that. So pretty soon we're going to have an episode. I think they call them uh, hashtag AMA, ask me anything. And you can ask me any question you want. It can be about derby or not derby. It can be about my pizza topping selection, whatever you want. Um, we're going to have one of those. So start sending those in now. You can send them to email or Facebook or Twitter or anything. All that stuff is available at the end and in the show notes. So send me your questions. I'm going to pile them up and then we're going to have a whole episode where I can answer anything you want. All right. I'll, I'll pick all the ones I like the best though. So make it a really good question. <laughs> all right. This question, uh, is from Kim Quad Smashian. <laughs> and Kim says, love your podcast. Is there anything that helped you as a rookie skater? Tips, where should they find full skate maintenance and knowledge of their boots? Like what are cushions for and what hardness to get? 
Why should I loosen my trucks and how much? Thanks for listening. As a vet, I think the rookies are getting lost. Kim, I wish I had an easier answer. I definitely just started typing back to you before I remembered, oh, I could talk back to you. I, I wish there was one, one perfect place where every question you have about roller skates and skate gear could be answered. I have not found quite the perfect place yet. I will say when I was a rookie, I started out like many, asked trusted teammates, maybe a coach. Then I'd talk to a vendor, a skate shop owner type person. But as time has gone by, I've learned a few things. One, teammates will tell you what worked for themselves. And we're all different, so what worked for them might not be the best thing for you, but you don't even know what the best thing is for you yet, so it's at least a starting point to learn from. And with vendors, not all are created equal. Not all skate shop owners are geniuses and knowledgeable about everything because a lot of them are skaters and, and just like the things that work for them too. So you got to find the ones that are knowledgeable about a lot of people. You think they know everything because they know more than you, but they don't know everything about you. So as you go on in your career, you're going to start to understand what your skating style is, what your body and feet feel like and don't like, and you can cater things to your needs. So as far as resources go, many skate shops have information sections on their website somewhere where they can try to show you how to maintain your skates, gear, or answer questions. I have not yet found one that seemed to be an exhaustive list of all the answers to all of my questions, but it is a start, right? As for cushions, I've got two links that I'm going to put in the show notes where some folks really dug deep into this if you want to get into it, the nitty gritty. But the sum up version is there's different hardnesses, there's different colors, and some are cone shaped. Generally, softer cushions or bushings, they're, they're, those two terms are used, uh, are recommended for lighter skaters and harder are recommended for heavier or stronger skaters. Bonnie Thunders is a lighter skater, but she's also a stronger skater. And from what I've read, she prefers harder. But the soft also helps get you a more severe angle on your skates for changing direction, and the harder requires more force to change the angle, but holds the turn a little better, and you get more snap coming out of it. The cones, they give you more range of motion when skating. And whatever type you get, in theory, should be replaced every year, depending on how much you are skating. I will confess, I have not done this religiously, <laughs> but... Uh, you, you can, if you're starting to think about new skates, maybe try that first and see if you can get a little bit more life out of, of your skating. I think I'm somewhere in the middle for my choice on cushions as I play both positions on my team and I want to do all the things well, so I don't cater to one type. And then for the trucks, I'm also got a link in the show notes here for a forum thread where a lot of people had some opinions. And again, I'm going to summarize with trucks. The tighter you go, the more stable your skate is, but it's harder to turn and have a nice sharp lateral motion. If it's very tight, you may skid easily. My first pair of skates had these nylon trucks that didn't really have any action to them. There was nothing to adjust and I had almost zero lateral motion. Like I really struggled to complete the laterals part of my basic skills. It was the skill that was really hard for me and I didn't realize it was my skates holding me back but that's that's what was going on there uh, the looser you go with your trucks the sharper you can turn but you're going to lose some stability and control and whenever I get new trucks I like to leave them a little bit tight to start so I can get used to this is what the whole skate feels like right now because there's a lot of new things there and then I'm going to gradually loosen my trucks bit by bit I don't want them to feel squirrely where they've got a mind of their own and my legs are shaking, <laughs> but I like them to be loose right up to that point and then I can tighten them back a bit. It's good to find that happy balance between the two that works for you. And if you've never loosened up your trucks before, it's really good to ask a seasoned veteran on your team who understands gear to do it because they're not going to take it too far and do anything that you're not ready for. And make sure when you're loosening your trucks that you're loosening them evenly front and back with both skates. I like to count the number of clicks my wrench makes just to be sure. Oh my gosh, the wind is picking up so much. I don't know if you can hear that. 
<laughs> oh, I'm in a very stormy place. Okay, I gotta finish up. Okay, um, as far as resources go, I've started adding a few of my own along with the skating videos I've done on Facebook and YouTube. Because recently that episode I did on bout day rituals, I explained in detail about how to clean wheels, bearings, wash your gear. And then Coach Jan points out, why didn't you just make a video instead of talking them all to death? So I did. So uh, the one on cleaning wheels and bearings is available now on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. If you haven't subscribed on YouTube yet, uh, you can go ahead if you're a youtube like person, but I understand a lot more of us are on Facebook for the social aspect and that's okay too. And I'm, I did a public service announcement type for cleaning gear and that's going up this week. If you saw my video on the dangers of Velcro, you'll enjoy the drama of the hazards of stinky gear at the beginning of the video. Oh, okay, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call the jam on this before we lose power and I lose this episode completely. But before I go, I want to say thank you so much to Natalie879 for your review on Apple Podcast. I really appreciate so much anytime any of you just... Take the time to leave me a review. It's so helpful. Take care. Have a lovely week. I hope if it's storming where you are that it's as exciting as this one. Okay, bye.